Okay, we are live. It is my great pleasure to welcome to our virtual primate conversation series, Dr. Gladys Kalemazikusoka, a multi-award winning conservationist, veterinarian, and founder and CEO of the NGO Conservation Through Public Health. Dr. Gladys has had a fascinating and multifaceted career. Trained as a veterinarian at the University of London's Royal Veterinary College, Dr. Gladys became the first person to hold the role of wildlife vet for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. She completed a zoological medicine res residency and master's in specialized veterinary medicine at North Carolina State University and North Carolina, Carolina Zoological Park and earned a certificate in nonprofit management from Duke University. In 2016, Dr. Gladys completed an MBA in global business and sustainability. Her work as a vet has had a great impact, specifically her work on identifying how parasites are transmitted from humans to mountain gorillas. To help protect vulnerable gorilla populations and curb disease transmission, Dr. Gladys created the nonprofit Conservation Through Public Health in 2003, an organization that promotes conservation by improving the quality of life of both people and wildlife through a One Health approach. In 2015, Dr. Gladys and CTPH also established the social enterprise Gorilla Conservation Coffee, which supports local coffee farmers. Dr. Gladys's work as an advocate for gorillas and wildlife uh, sorry, excuse me, Dr. Gladys's work as an advocate for gorillas and wildlife um, and is an inspiration to many. She's a National Geographic Explorer, winner of Sierra Club's 2018 Earth Care Award, winner of the 2009 White League Gold Award for Outstanding Leadership in Grassroots Nature Conservation, and recent recipient of the 2020 Aldo Leopold Award for the, from the American Society of Mammalogists, amongst many other honors. Dr. Gladys was also profiled in the BBC documentary, Gladys the African Vet, and has been featured in many internationally viewed documentaries. She currently serves on the Leadership Council of Women for the Environment in Africa. Welcome to Oxford, Dr. Gladys. We are so, so glad to have you. And I am now going to mute my microphone and turn off my camera. And when are, whenever you are ready, um, feel free to start. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I'm really excited um, to talk about our work and everything we've done. I've been working with primates, I guess, for about 30 years, and mainly with the gorillas, which is what I'm going to talk about just now. And in the meantime, let me get ready to share my screen. Um, get ready to share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Um, not, no, not yet. Yes. Okay. We just practiced it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A minute. Hmm. Okay, here it is. <laughs> Perfect, that is working. Great. <laughs> well, thank you again for inviting me to speak today. And I'm really excited. I have some connections with the University of Oxford and including with uh, the person who supervised my first research in University of Oxford, used to be a professor in the University of Oxford. And that was um, Professor Vernon Reynolds. I first wanted to study mountain gorillas. Very few people know that I studied chimps. But at the time that I wanted to study the mountain gorillas, they were not habituated yet for tourism. And they were allowing very few researchers there. And they weren't really habituated for research either, actually. But I got a chance to study wild chimpanzees Dongo Forest when I was working as a, when I was studying as to become a vet, to become a vet at the Royal Vet College, University of London. And so I started off with working, chimps at the, working with chimps at the Entebbe Zoo and then later on working 
in Budongo Forest with wild chimpanzees, which was my first time to study primates in the wild. I got a lot of support when I was there. And then two years later, I got an opportunity to study the mountain gorillas in Bwindi, looking at home with parasites as well, but I also added bacteria. And that was the time when tourism had just begun. So I was able to compare gorillas visited by tourists and a group that wasn't visited by tourists. So one good, very good way of getting involved in primate conservation or conservation in general is by doing research. And in our organization, Conservation Through Public Health, we host students for research and students who just want to come and see what we're doing. And I always encourage them to first get involved and do some research. So I've worked with mountain gorillas for since 1994, when I went out to do the research and I spent one month there. And this particular gorilla is called Kanyonyi. He's one of my favorite, he was one of my favorite gorillas in Windy. And unfortunately he died three years ago of natural causes, not human related. But I operated in his older sister when he was about two years old, when she had a rectal prolapse and he grew up all his life seeing people. So when he became a silverback, he actually used to get too close to tourists and used to try and frighten them to see the reaction. But he represented how far conservation has gone in Uganda and where people really, really, the community is so much involved in conservation and they're very willing to protect the gorillas. I first started working in Bwindi and that's the main place where we work. We do a little bit of work in the Rurungas, but mainly in Bwindi. And the Bwindi population of mountain gorillas was only discovered in the 80s. The Virunga one was discovered much earlier. And that's when suddenly the number of mountain gorillas doubled when the Bwindi population was discovered. But gorillas all over Africa are suffering from habitat loss. And here in Uganda, um, poaching is also an issue. But people in Uganda and Rwanda don't eat gorillas. Um, actually, the Batwa who live in Windy Forest, who lived there before it became a national park, it started off as a forest reserve. Um, it was a taboo for them to look in the eyes of a gorilla. So the gorillas were protected because they never ever targeted them. They kind of coexisted with them. But of course, when it became a national park, it became difficult to have both people living in there as tourists were coming in to track them. So the Batwa ended up having to be taken out of the park and put in settlements outside the park. But in other countries in Africa, gorillas are eaten. However, gorillas in Windy um, and Virunga suffer from snares put out for daikar and bush pig, where they get accidentally caught in snares or get speared, which is something that happened quite recently last year during the pandemic. And, but part of the reason for the habitat loss is a very, very, very high human population growth around the area. And it's the same in almost all the places where they're found all over Africa. And we find that as long as people have too many children who they can't look after, they'll always have to go into the forest to look for food. And they also sometimes cut trees. And most of Windy doesn't have a buffer zone. It's a hard edge, which makes it very difficult. But there's also a unique threat, which is disease transmission, which happens actually once great apes are habituated for either research or tourism, disease transmission then becomes another very big threat. And although I was hired as a first vet for the Uganda National Parks, which became the Uganda Wildlife Authority, because there were gorilla tourism had just begun two years before, and they were concerned that the tourists who come were gonna make the gorillas sick. But however, what ended up making the gorillas, the first gorilla disease gorillas in Windy got was not from tourists, but from the local community. And this baby gorilla died of scabies and the rest of the group could had to be treated with ivermectin for them to survive. And we found, we found that it came from people living around the park who had very little healthcare. These little boys were supposed to be in school but they were herding goats. So this was something that we realized that we really needed to address healthcare in Windy in order to protect the gorillas. And how did they get it? They like to go outside the park to eat people's banana plants. When they, gorilla tourism began and they became habituated, they started to go back to the places where they used to go before, because now they've lost their fear of people. And this particular farmer whose banana plant was destroyed, I asked him if he likes gorillas still. And he said to me, this was shortly after they had been destroyed. And he said, 
he likes them because he thinks they're important because his children are employed by the park. And some of the money from tourism goes to support the community to build schools, clinics, and roads. But the individual farmer like him whose crop gets destroyed, he's not being compensated. So at the time I told my bosses, and eventually he became one of the members of the human and gorilla conflict team that had gorillas back to the park when they come out. And his son became one of the main supervisors of the Hugos, um, this conflict resolution team, who we now call Gorilla Guardians, a CTPH. And he's a ranger, but he also manages the Gorilla Guardians. And so crop raiding is quite a big problem. And then this micro hydro dam was built in Winnipeg Trouble Forest. And it came about because, you know, Budi is not only an important part for tourism, but it's also important as a water source. And my husband's a founder member of Conservation Food Public Health, which we basically set up to address these issues. And he conducted UNIDO and the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, who contacted GIZ, the German Development Agency, and they put up this micro hydro dam, which is managed by the community. And it's great because it provided electricity at the time when there was no electricity. It only came about five years ago to Windy. And, but the gorillas like to play and they also like to hang out over here. So we realized that we needed to set up an organization that improves the health of the people and their conservation attitudes and also to protect the gorillas. So we have a wildlife conservation program and an active community health program. We started off with these two programs, but we found out that many people were unhealthy because they were poor and the NGOs that were working at Windy were addressing livelihoods mainly, but there are certain elements that they weren't addressing. So we realized that we also needed to start to address those as well. So within the wildlife conservation program, we mainly started off with wildlife health, where we have a gorilla health and community conservation center built with support from TASC trust. And then we also went into habitat conservation because we realized that we're not only protecting the gorillas as a species, but also their habitat. Then with the community health program, it progresses, it progressed into strengthening community-based healthcare. We started off with drama workshops. Then we started to support community health workers to do conservation work. And then we also started to support animal health workers to do conservation work. And those are the main groups that we work with. And uh, then we started a gorilla conservation coffee social enterprise because we found that many farmers around the park were not getting a steady market or a fair price for their coffee. So I developed these brochures when I was in my last year working as the first bit for Uganda Wildlife Authority because people were concerned that not only were gorillas going into people's gardens and coming into contact with dirty clothing, which led to something like scabies, a coptic mange, and they felt that they were also finding people had openly defecated, they didn't have toilets, and then they were also finding they were not covering their rubbish heaps. And me being the only vet in the organization was told to set up this program, a health education program. And so it was a big turning point in my life because that's when I got involved in public health. And a lot of what, when we had these workshops where we reached about a thousand people in eight villages, a lot of the ideas that they came up with to how we can improve the situation because we went to villages that were benefiting from tourism in Uganda, villages that hadn't yet quite started benefiting but wanted to, and then we went to Congo, because this same gorilla group used to range in Congo. And in Congo, they actually lied to us that they had never seen gorillas because they thought we had come to arrest them um, because some of the gorillas had disappeared there and we went with soldiers for protection. And so we had to be very careful how we introduced the topic. And it, it was a big eye opener for me to learn a lot about conservation just to have those three experiences of different levels of benefits that people have had from tourism and how they perceived gorillas. And so one of the big things that we do in our community health program is we train village health and conservation teams to conduct house home visits and group talks. They're able to reach very many people. And it was a system that the government had kind of started somewhere else, then we started it. Then later on, it picked up in Windy, and now we basically work very closely with them. And we had somebody over there, Dr. Lynn Gaffikin, in that photograph, who had helped, had worked with the big international NGOs like WWF and CI to set up what you call PHE, Integrated Population Health and Environment Programs. And so when we got some support from USAID, they asked us to come and help us 
to set up the public health program, especially with a focus on family planning. So that was very good. And we're really pleased that half our volunteers were men and half were women. So we actually addressed the gender issue and we went for couple peer education because what we generally found was that most of the girls were, te also the girls who were teenagers were already mothers by the age of 15. So it was very difficult to say that we're focusing on the youth alone. And then if we thought, if we only focused on the women, we found that their husbands, Barra University of Science and Technology did a, a feasibility study for us to carry out family planning. And they found that, you know, women would lie to their husbands that they're not on family planning, but quietly go to the hospital like this one, get an injection and go back home. And then their husbands would start wondering why they're not getting pregnant and they would even start beating them. So we're like, no, we should make it couple peer education so that the husbands buy into the whole reason why, why family planning is beneficial for the family, you know? One is that it's better for the men to balance their family budgets better. So they reduce poverty in their home. And for the women, it was more of a case of having more control also over their bodies. And so it worked very well and it really empowered women. Like this lady Hope is giving a talk to her community. The time when I can carried out the health education workshops a few years earlier with the community conservation range and warden and sub-county health assistant who were men, I was leading the workshops and women were whispering, oh, we need to educate our girl child. And so just by being out there in the communities, we started to realize it's really important to engage women in conservation. And these are the kind of families we found. People are having babies every year. So the average family size was 10 people per family when we started out, quite shocking. And these were just the live births. And we tried to tell them that, you know, maybe let's reduce to four people per family. Let's not be too ambitious. And um, it's really started to work. So we promoted good, we promote good health and hygiene simply because a lot of these infectious diseases come about because of poor hygiene. We focus on scabies, tuberculosis, and other respiratory diseases. And then voluntary family planning was very big, nutrition, sustainable agriculture. And then we asked them to report homes visited by gorillas because it's a big problem in Windy. But then once they report those homes, then we allowed the wildlife authority and all the human gorilla conflict team and they come and had them back quicker. And we focused a lot on the awareness of zoonotic disease and why it's important to protect the gorillas and the forest and ecotourism. In fact, the Wildlife Authority actually spoke to this group of volunteers when we had a workshop a few years ago before the pandemic and talked to them about how they would like to share their revenue in the communities and how they can apply for revenue sharing funds. So it was a group of people that the health people could talk to and the Wildlife Authority could talk to to get health and conservation messages out. And we've so far reached quite a lot of homes through this method. And I also learned a lot about behavior change communication, which is really, really advanced in the public health sector compared to the conservation sector. They tend to have like the bad family and the good family, which works really well in Africa and developing countries. It's called shaming. So the bad family basically has very many children, as you can see in the flip charts. Half of them are going to school and half of them are not. We found that when we did a survey is that they have 10 children or many children, half go to school and the other half have to stay behind to chase wildlife from the garden. And eventually, you know, these children who don't go to school become teenage pregnancies. When the gorillas come to their garden, they try and chase them themselves and they get scratched. And there's a possibility of zoonotic disease transmission as well as injuries. And the father goes into the forest to poach with his children. He gets arrested by a ranger. Later on, he beats up his wife because He's frustrated and they have, and eventually some of the children die early. So that's the bad family. And then the good family, they plan to have four children before they get married. And after they get married, they have the four children, they all go to school. Even the girls go to school, not just the boys. When it's time to have food, they have enough food. They're not fighting for food, unlike the, the bad family. <laughs> and when the gorillas come out, they call out the Hugo members to charge them back, which prevents injury and disease transmission. And then later on, the boy becomes a ranger, the girl becomes a nurse, and you say, which one would you rather be? And it's really helped to change people's attitudes towards family planning and the forest in general. We found that the family planning was the most, family planning injections was the most popular contraceptive. And we trained people to be able to give it from the comfort of their own homes. 
through a partnership with Family Health International when they were scaling it up around Uganda. I mean, actually, no, we were pilot sites. And then uh, we were among the five pilot sites. And eventually, they scaled it all over Uganda. It became a national policy for lay community health workers to give injections. And they also scaled it all over Africa. And how do we sustain them? We give them group income generating projects. They actually asked for them at the very beginning. And one of our founder members, Stephen Rubanga, used to work for the Ministry of Agriculture. And when they asked for goats and cows, he said, rather than giving it as an individual project, individual goat or cow, it's better to give it as a group livestock project um, so that it sustains, so that it brings them together and they can actually have a viable business out of it. And as a result, we haven't had dropouts for the past 13 years. We only had two people dropping out when they joined a born again church that was against contraception quite recently. And then when CARE went, came along and they were promoting village saving and loan associations, to our surprise, one day we went to a meeting and they said, oh, we have this passbook. They even branded it with our logo. And they're like, you know, the money that we get from the cattle and the goats, we reinvest it into the BSLAs. And they were really happy. So without a salary, they were earning an income and we haven't had dropouts. We've carried out quite a lot of comparative disease investigations and Bijadi and crypto are one of the pathogens we've been looking at and looking at it in people, gorillas and livestock. And we published a paper in Frontiers. And one thing that we found is that Jadia had really gone down in the gorillas. Actually, at the time that we did the study, there was no Jadia. Yet in the past, there used to be quite a lot. And we, so we realized that the community health program was helping to improve community hygiene and reducing diseases such as Jadia. But the communities that were the poorest had a, quite a bit of crypto. And the gorillas also had crypto that used to cross in those communities. And so we ended up increasing the number of village health and conservation teams in those villages. We worked with a student from University of California, Davis, uh, Ryan Sadler, who we published this paper with. And he went with the community animal health workers to collect samples from the cattle. And he actually got a company to donate the field kits that we used the first time around, which was great. We started off with a small gorilla research clinic and eventually we built a bigger gorilla health and community conservation center. We got some support from Bayer Pharmaceuticals, a nurse who used to work in Bayer Pharmaceuticals and was actually a nurse at the Royal Vet College where I did my vet school. And she, we built the very first clinic and then later on we got funding from Task Trust to build the bigger clinic. And these two students are vet students who were looking at entamoeba and stress hormones in gorillas together with Stephen our other founder member. We've also hosted medical students. This student came from Australia and because she got to Buindi, she was studying integrated population health and environment, PhD, in a first ecosystem. She came over, she had done some work with Blue Ventures looking at PhD in a, in a marine ecosystem and Blue Ventures sent her to us. Both Alistair and I are Ashoka Fellows because, and we are probably one of the very few Ashoka fellows who integrate health and conservation. And that's how we met through the Ashoka network. And so when she came to do some research with us and study what we're doing, she ended up going to the hospital and getting lots of experience injecting babies because the nurse, there was only one nurse who was totally overworked. So that was a very interesting experience for her. We've also had a student from the Duke University School of Environment who's also come and studied the role of women in conservation. So our impact since 2003 is that the mountain gorilla population has gone up and we're glad to have contributed to that along with other conservation NGOs and the Wildlife Authority, which really, really, really increased law enforcement when it became a national park. We're pleased to have been part of that. I was actually involved in the very first census in 1998. And when we, when we first counted the Bwindi gorillas and found 300, and now the number is gone up you know, one and a half times to 460. So we're very pleased about that. And some of the, what we've done as CTPH, we've seen that gorillas are better protected in community land. When Kanyonyi's father, Ruhendeza, got too old to keep up with the group, which happens with gorillas, and he decided to settle in community land. And we, our volunteers spoke to the communities to tolerate him, you know, taking an occasional banana plant so that because he had done so much to enable tourism to happen, which has then resulted in you know, the communities benefiting a lot and being lifted out of poverty. And when he died, they all came to his grave to pay their last respects, which basically shows how much people appreciate gorillas around Windy. 
we've seen a very high increase in hand washing facilities from 10% to 75%. And we've had re reduced human related outbreaks in the gorillas, both for scabies and jadia, um, and an increase in of women in family planning. If we started off below the national average and now we're aware about the national average, which is something that we're very pleased about. And uh, we've seen men, women are more involved in conservation and men in family planning. We've worked with government partners to train them in the village health and conservation team approach. And actually we teamed up with uh, Professor E.J. Muna Galland and her team in the Department of Zoology to do some research to see what, how health benefits that we've been carrying out have benefited conservation and sustainable development. This was funded by Darwin Initiative. And then we developed a policy brief with IIED um, to talk about this and the Uganda Poverty and Conservation Learning Group. And these are people from DRC and Mount Elgon National Park coming to learn about our approach at our Gorilla Health Center to come and see how they can scale it up in their countries. So some of the research questions we're looking at, are integrated approaches good enough in addressing public health and conservation and fragile ecosystems? How effective is health as an ICD? At the time we started CTPH, everyone used to talk about ICDs and health. We brought in health as an integrated conservation and development intervention. What diseases are shared at the human wildlife livestock interface? Currently, we're looking, we're having a big focus on COVID and what can be done to maintain healthy ecosystems and viable wildlife populations. We're also looking very much at ecotourism. How can it be implemented in a way that minimizes risk to great apes? And how effective is livestock in preventing poaching? And what eco health interventions can contribute to climate change? And how can we translate the research to policy? This is a student called Alison Haynes, who did her research from the University of Kent, Canterbury, and she was asking tourists whether they're willing to wear masks before they track gorillas. This was in 2011, while they're tracking gorillas. And it was interesting that 51% of them said yes. And then a few years later, another student from Ohio University did similar research, and it had gone up to 73%. So for those of you who get a chance to come to Bwindi or have had that chance to come to Bwindi, you will be told that you have to be seven meters away from the gorillas and that's how far seven meters is. And these tourists were actually viewing gorillas at the right distance in seven meters. But through the research done by Annalisa from Ohio University, she found that almost all the time, 98% of the time, people and gorillas got too close to each other and 60% of the time they got closer than three meters and 40% of the time it was the gorillas who broke the rules. Very dangerous situation when, you, when it came to the COVID-19 pandemic. We were very, very concerned about it, but when the pandemic occurred, we, got, we really freaked out because we're like, if tourists can get that close to gorillas, less than three meters, someone can easily cough on them and make them sick and wipe out a whole gorilla group or even many more gorillas in the forest because they meet with each other. And so we found that we really had to do something about preventing this. And having all that COVID likely came from, originated in bats and the immediate intermediate host hasn't been found, but it looks like the first cases were found in the Wuhan wet life market. Jump to people and you can easily jump back to animals again. We had to do something about it. And we often got asked, um, a non-human great ace susceptible to COVID, the human common flu viruses have affected the great apes over the past 15 years. And human metanema virus affected mountain gorillas in Rwanda. That's part of the human common flu viruses. Lethal rhino C virus affected chimps in Kibale National Park, killing about five chimps. And the metanema infection killed two gorillas. And then there's a human coronavirus outbreak that occurred in chimps in Ivory Coast. They didn't die, but they got sick. And it came from people. Um, and then, Last year, people did research and found that people, great apes and other old world primates have the same AC2 protein receptors and they're highly susceptible to COVID. Then at the beginning of this year, gorillas in San Diego Zoo got COVID from asymptomatic keepers. And so did gorillas in Prague Zoo. And the symptoms were very similar to humans where they all got sick, they got treated with fluids and antibiotics and the old silverback only recovered by being given expensive monoclonal antibodies similar to the same treatment that was actually given to President Trump during, during, the, during the elections and he got better very quickly. 
So we realized that the way it manifests itself in people is the same way it manifests itself in great apes, and we need to be very careful. But even before it was found in that there was proven transmission to captive great apes, we held a, a workshop in March 2020 um, when the pandemic had just reached Uganda with all these partners, uh, UWA, Mountain Gorilla Vet Project, International Gorilla Conservation Program, and Max Planck to look at how we can upgrade the great ape viewing guidelines. We got the rangers to wear masks um, and everyone now has to have their temperature taken before they enter the forest, which was never used to happen before. And hand washing became very strict at that point. And the great thing is that the Wildlife Authority made them even more stringent by getting people to you know, enforce, the, they enforce the seven meter distance. We found that tourists are now demanding that they don't make the gorillas and chimps sick. They're the same people who used to break the rules. Many of them are now demanding that they don't want to come and visit if they're going to make these animals sick. And that's one good thing that the pandemic has brought about is that people are much more conscious about how they can make each other sick and how they can make the great apes sick. And this is our first day when we're wearing masks. And now that's the only way to trap gorillas in Bwindi or Kibale or Budongo, but you have to wear masks when you visit them. We also donated infrared thermometers um, and that has really helped. So we developed these posters with support from Solidaridad. They actually had developed them for people and just we added a component of gorillas. And on these posters, we have the warden's names where people can call them if gorillas are seen in their gardens. And this was supported by the ACAS Foundation. The ACAS Foundation also helped us to train the human and gorilla conflict resolution teams. And they move around with these posters. They all have to wear masks as they're herding gorillas back. We also train the village health and conservation teams in COVID-19 mitigation. And they also tell people that they have to be healthy and hygienic. And as a result of their work, the number of hand washing facilities drastically went up during the pandemic. We worked with Ride for a Woman. Um, they helped us to make the masks during this time. She was about to lay off all the women, Evelyn Habasa and her husband, David. Dennis are from the local community. And they were about to lay off these women who they started to engage because they were disadvantaged. And the tourists loved going to Ride for a Woman because they could get tablecloths, very nice clothes like Bitenji. And now, the tourists were not coming. So she was about to lay off all the women and then we got her to make masks and she was able to keep some of them going, which is great. Another thing that we're very concerned about was how do we keep, how do we support coffee farmers around the park? Because we had started this social enterprise, but our main markets were tourists and they were no longer coming. And so we, for example, this is the Entebbe duty free. They used to order every week. Then they started ordering then they didn't order for about nine months. Then in December, they started ordering once a month and the pandemic really affected everybody. So we had to look beyond Uganda to increase our international sales. We had very few international sales and it was mainly through Pangos, they were our main distributor. But then they ran out of coffee in March, 2020, around the time that people want, now wanted to order it because when we would give talks and say, you can support the gorillas by buying coffee, even if you can't come, they suddenly ran out of coffee. And we were able to get money roll beans in the UK, Vicky, to distribute coffee. She's placed eight orders since May 2020. She's now our biggest distributor outside Uganda. And you can actually buy the coffee and support the gorillas just by, even if you're not able to come. And so these farmers at least were able to have an income. But unfortunately, we had a setback. In spite of the benefits that tourism has brought for the community, because there was no tourism during the pandemic, this particular person went, came and speared this gorilla, Rafiki, when he was hunting, not gorillas, but daikar and bush pig, as you can see in the photos. And he admitted it, and he's been put in jail for 11 years. That's the longest anyone has ever been put in jail for killing any wild animal in Uganda. And it was a big victory for conservation, but people like him are very poor. We visited his wife a few months ago, and she was among the poorest of the poor. She has three children below the age of three, and she's very poor, she doesn't have land. She only has to, she's living on the land of her grandfather, her husband's grandfather. When we went to check on Rafiki's group and also collecting fecal samples, because we're testing COVID in the gorillas by collecting fecal samples, um, we went with a porter. Um, he, had an, he was one of the first porters to get a job 
in those first six months, because when we went to check on Rafiki's group, tourism wasn't open yet. And he was wearing a mask saying in memory of Rafiki, he's from the local community. They were very, very upset when this happened. So it was one of those very, very big things that really affected the community. But we knew that as long as there were poor people in the park, you know, who are hungry and desperate, this was going to happen again. And Ramutwe, who's now heading the group, is not a silverback, but he was the most mature blackback. The group broke from 17 to 11, and some of them went to other groups. And um, luckily in January this year, we got some good news that a baby was born. So it's now gone to 12. And so we decided that if we don't do anything about it, people are still going to go into the park to poach, um, in spite of this very heavy fine. So we started to engage the vulnerable communities, including reform poachers, who, who had basically, you'd find that somebody is a porter, their dad is a reform poacher, but now as a porter, he's no longer getting any money because tourists are not there. His dad is gonna go back into the forest. So everybody's connected in one way or another. And so we found it was very important to give fast growing seedlings to reformed poachers, the Batwa, and people like this, you know, this poor lady whose husband is now in jail. And we managed to identify them through the local leaders. And the, they now have all received these fast growing seedlings, which grow within four months. And which means that even when tourism returns, they'll always have something to eat. People in Windy used to only farm before tourism came. Then when tourism came, many of them gave up farming because they make a lot more money taking someone up to the gorillas or selling crafts and then digging in the garden all day long. But now we're trying to tell them, go back to farming, but farm more sustainably. And when tourism comes back, you always have something to eat and the money can be used for other things. And we actually want to distribute to another 5,000 homes around Windy. But that was a start that we got with funding from IUCN and other donors. And I'll end off by talking about the fact that we're not only mitigating COVID in the communities that we're working in, but also beyond Windy and working together with the Africa CSO Biodiversity Alliance, which was developed during the pandemic to strengthen the African voice within the Convention on Biological Diversity. We are managing to reach governments, donors, and tour companies by writing a policy brief. And there are actually 33 tourism sites in Africa in 10 countries with great ape tourism. The most active is Uganda and Rwanda, but there's also Tanzania. And we're trying to, and some countries all over West Africa. Then we've also got together an education campaign with the University of Exeter to, it's a big campaign where we did a survey of over a thousand people who are likely to visit great apes or have visited them. And we've also trained the rangers in Windy and Kantani National Park in Guinea-Bissau where Dr. Kim Hawkins works in the University of Exeter. And we're able, to, we're trying to generally upgrade great ape viewing guidelines all over Africa. This was also funded by Down Initiative. And um, currently now, because the pandemic, there's so many things happening. And this, our latest project, which we started actually in April this year, was vaccination education campaigns around the protected areas. We teamed up with the Ministry of Health to who are basically, you know, trying to get people to get vaccinated. And there's a lot of vaccine reluctance, but it's really important in the protected areas. Published a paper with Fabian, who's a very well-known One Health vet. And basically we're trying, this paper was about telling people to vaccinate. It's important to vaccinate people in biodiversity hotspots because once we don't have severe COVID, we're less likely to give it to great apes or other animals like felids, as has been seen in zoos and the mink. And then they're less likely then to pass the strains back to us, which could be so virulent that they can't, they can evade vaccination or treatment. So we're working closely with the Uganda Ministry of Health and we managed to advocate for park staff and conservation personnel working with great apes to be among them first to be vaccinated. And I remember Vernon contacting me quite in March saying, could the Budongo, could the Budongo field assistants be among those? And they are among the priority groups. And we feel that once people are vaccinated, it will really help because in a meeting we had with two operators last week, they actually told us that tourists, a few tourists are willing to come to Uganda right now, but they don't want to meet communities. They just want to go to the gorillas and go back home. And this is because they're worried about getting COVID from communities. Tourists used to love visiting communities, but now they just don't want to see them. And 
So the moment we can get these communities vaccinated, you know, they should voluntarily go up and get vaccinated. They will be able to have income again, and they want they can get, you know, overcome their situation of poverty that they're going through right now. So the Ministry of Health and the health partners who are helping them to develop this vaccine vaccination campaign thought it was fantastic to add that extra message to the vaccination campaigns. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, for more information, please visit our website, buy coffee and follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for your talk. That was absolutely fascinating. And the work that UNCTVH do is inspiring to I'm sure everyone listening and especially to those of us doing research my instinct is like, how can we help and what can we do? Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your, for your talk. And a lot of questions have come in. So I've tried to, we've tried to group them into some categories. So hopefully it's not all over the place, but um, we'll start with sort of maybe talking about uh, guerrilla and human conflict, which you, you talked about. And uh, it shows from your talk that um, local communities are very fuel for the guerrillas and respect the guerrillas. Um, but obviously they do sometimes come into anthropogenic areas. And so what types of methods are used to reduce guerrilla and community conflict if it comes up and beyond maybe education, sorry for the siren, um, beyond maybe educating, are there other methods that you use? And we have methods that we use both outside the park and inside the park. I think for outside the park, it's more like getting people to safely have the gorillas back, which is the gorilla guardians or the human gorilla conflict resolution team. And they basically, they're not given a salary either. They're sustained through livestock projects. And we also help them as well. And by doing that, they're able to keep the gorillas away from the people as much as possible. Uh, but other things that we do, you know, education is actually the main way, but just the fact that we're able to provide them alternatives. We did a survey as we're distributing the seedlings to the communities. And we found out that the main reason, the way that the pandemic has affected them most, because we asked that question, how has the pandemic affected you? They said it's mainly been through hunger. The pandemic has made them very hungry. And so if we can find ways to reduce hunger, then there's less need for them to enter the park just to feed their families. And so, yeah, looking at things like that and livestock, you know, like livestock projects, so you don't have, if they have animal protein, they're less likely to go in for animal protein, but also the coffee, the fact that they can earn a living from their coffee. When we started to engage the coffee farmers, one of our, we have started engaging them by going to people who we already knew, who were already engaging in other conservation programs. They turned out to be Arabica coffee farmers. And that's the coffee farmers who were mainly engaging because that's the coffee that everyone prefers. And it's very good coffee. And uh, they kind of said, one of them said to me that it's good we're engaging these people because some of them are hunters, or poachers. And if we keep them busy growing good coffee, it will, keep, it will keep them outside the park. But also some of these people, when they want meat, it's easier to go and kill a diker or a bush pig than to go and save up money to buy a kilo of meat. But if we give them enough money through coffee and where we give them good prices for good coffee, because we have to be able to sell it, and it has to be good coffee, then, then they don't, then it keeps helps to keep them outside the forest. So that's another way that we're engaging people and stopping them going into the forest. Yeah, thank you for that. And I guess an offshoot of that question is, so with education and with those methods, you can sort of help to reduce human and guerrilla conflict, but with livestock, and you touched on this briefly, but how can you keep the gorillas from interfering with livestock or potentially getting diseases that are passed along through exposure to livestock? Or as we saw with, I mean, I guess this is beyond sort of livestock and agriculture, but with pa uh, potentially pangolins involvement with COVID transmission and that kind of thing, is there anything that you do to mediate that risk? Um, yes. Well, when the gorillas come to people's gardens, um, that's another another thing that we do is we take, we also analyze, regularly analyze samples in livestock as well. So not only from the gorillas where every single month, each, each habituated gorilla group has a fecal sample taken from them. You know, we have staff who do that all the time and 
we analyze the samples in our gorilla in the field laboratory at our gorilla health center but then we also look at livestock samples from time to time especially where in the areas where gorillas go outside the park we also collect samples from livestock and from people and we talk to people to keep to try and through the gorilla guardians we keep them outside we try our best to keep them outside people's gardens so they don't pick up diseases from the livestock but we also do a lot of deworming of the livestock working with community animal health workers and we've also started deworming of the people working with through our village health and conservation teams and working closely with the hospitals so we just try and see how much we can also improve the health of the livestock and their productivity so that people can get more out of their animals and there's less need for them to enter the park and speaking of pangolins windy also has pangolins and you know we started doing some work with the uh, people who work with pangolins and what we do is basically there's some people out there who try and sell pangolins sometimes they get them from drc which is just neighboring the windy forest and we examine these pangolins before they're released into the forest to just to make sure that they're not spreading diseases into the forest, but we need to get them away from the local communities as well. So yeah, there's a lot going on there with potential disease transmission. And yeah, we're beginning to look at other species as well, collecting their samples and trying to see how we can prevent disease transmission between gorillas and other wildlife and livestock and people. It's amazing how much CTPH does contained within this. It's like every, there's so many offshoots and I, I feel like, so much is covered by this by this nonprofit. It's amazing, and there's so many things that must pop up, like COVID, that are unexpected. And um, it's amazing how adaptable um, you guys are. And I guess, sort of on that note, um, how much do you, how often do you find yourself working with similar teams at other gorilla sites or other great ape sites um, in other countries or different regions? Um, is there a lot of cooperation and networking between these groups or does CTPH feel sort of more self-contained? You do the work that you do and other organizations in other parts of the world do what they do. Is there, is there any sort of global network um, of conservation organizations that can work with great apes and prevent pathogen transmission and global health and One Health solutions? Yes, that network is definitely growing. Um, there's one network that I'd like to mention. There's the African Primate Society, and which was set up as an um, affiliate to the International Primate Society in, in 2016. And the first conference was held in 2017 in the Ivory Coast, where Dr. Inza Kone became the president and I became the vice president. And then in 2019, we had a big conference here in Uganda where Professor Bannon Reynolds spoke and Dr. Jengudo was, was given an award. She gave a speech through the video. And uh, Professor Ra Dr. Russ Mittermeier is now the patron of APS. So it brought together so many primatologists. Also, Professor John Oates got an award. Professor Chris, um, Dr. Basuta also got an award. And he had trained so many conservationists in Uganda. So it was just an amazing time for us to recognize that. But also in that process, we had primatologists from all over Africa. And the reason we set it up is to build African leadership in primatology. So we had primatologists from West Africa, Nigeria, there's a huge contingent from Nigeria and Central Africa. And they came over and were able to share a lot of experiences, lessons learned, best practices for research and conservation across the continent. Plus a lot of talks were given by students because we want to build their capacity and leadership in primatology. So we believe that through that kind of network, through the APS network, We'll be able to share lessons learned and so many experiences. And then there's the IUCN. IUCN, you know, the Uganda government agency, Uganda Wildlife Authority is a member of IUCN. Conservation through public health is a member of IUCN and so many conservation NGOs. And there are also many specialists on the IUCN. So I'm a member of the IUCN vet specialist group and also the great ape specialist group and the primate specialist group. And there was a special group that was set up for COVID. And we're all part members of all those. And on it are many vets who have a lot of expertise with great apes, both captive and wild great apes. And we all get together. We helped IUCN to shape the guidelines, the first set of guidelines before the pandemic and the most recent ones <laughs> following the gorillas in San Diego Zoo getting COVID. And where we now, now that vaccinations are available, we really recommend for all people visiting the great apes to be vaccinated and testing should be regular. So everything keeps upgrading over time. And the latest guidelines came out last month. 
So we, um, yes, we do. We do network a lot and share lessons. And Dr. Kim Hawkins, who is doing a lot of work in Guinea-Bissau, actually the reason she teamed up with us as well is because in where she works, there's very little tourism to the chimps. And where we work, there's so much tourism. <laughs> it's the most tourism in the world, the great apes. You know, like it was like 40,000 tourists per year before the pandemic, could you believe it? And now it's like maybe 10% because I guess after tourism closed during the pandemic for six months, because everyone was worried about gorillas getting diseases from people and chimps getting diseases from people, but also there were lockdowns all over the world. They were worried about disease between people. Then actually in uh, May, I think it was May or June, 2020, I was very impressed when the president made was talking, uh, giving his normal COVID speeches, like all heads of states in all countries about the economy and whether people can now, you know, whether they're gonna slow down, lock down, start to unlock the economy. He mentioned that tourism can start in June, but, Tourist, tourism to gorillas and chimpanzees cannot start yet because we don't want to make our cousins sick. He actually said that. And I was so excited to hear that from a head of state. And I felt that our advocacy efforts have really paid off all these years. And then later on in uh, end of September, they opened up for primate tourism, but very, very, very strict. So they try their best to keep, it, keep as strict as they can. But one thing that we're finding is as much as we now know that it's 10 meters between us and the gorillas. The gorillas don't know that. So they still come closer. Then you have to move back and we have to kind of dehabituate them to the fact that they can't come closer than 10 meters. And we're hoping that this is going to continue after the pandemic because there's COVID, but there's so many other respiratory diseases and you never know what the next more lethal pathogen may come around and cause another pandemic. So it's, we're hoping that these rules, actually it's, it's now got to the point that the wildlife authorities in Uganda, Rwanda, and DRC are going to maintain the wearing of masks even after the pandemic has ended, which is wonderful. And we hope that it's just going to protect everyone from so many other diseases, even beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. So yeah, we're trying hard to just, you know, make sure that all of these things continue even beyond the pandemic. Yeah, and I, I found it so moving when you said that the tourists are now sort of have a shift in, in how they understand their themselves as a risk factor and how yeah it's it's a interesting shift to think of the gorillas actually coming closer to you and you backing up rather than tourists who would be so eager to get really really close to to great apes and obviously now that people are so used to wearing masks it it's almost second nature and it doesn't seem like such a big imposition anymore and hopefully that sticks around um yeah I and mean, so this question um might be an ignorant one, but when you when you see, for example, if there were an outbreak of COVID um, amongst a wild population, or just generally, if there's any sort of clear, if a gorilla is suffering from a clear human illness that's been transmitted, is there ever a world in which you guys step in and help provide aid or sh vaccines or anything for the wild gorillas, or is it completely hands off? That's a very good question. It's been discussed quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> during the pandemic. Definitely for treatment, you know, once a, we find that a gorilla group is affected by COVID, no one should be allowed to visit them. No one will be able to visit them apart from the people who are treating them, you know, the most essential personnel. And that gorilla group would be off bounds for, you know, any visitation. And of course, it's the rangers who have to give an almost 24 hour watch to stop them mixing with other gorilla groups. So it's kind of like quarantining them off until they get better. And from the San Diego Zoo experience, when they shared with us the experiences, they shared them with everyone working with great apes in the wild, because they felt that the lessons that they've learned can help others. We were relieved to know that, you know, the antibiotics and that you treat, you know, humans with also worked well with the gorillas in San Diego Zoo. And so at least we know that that will work. And so that's the, an option that we have. But when it comes to vaccination, you know, I've even had somebody saying they want to donate vaccines for gorillas. And we've had discussions with the Wildlife Authority and other conservation partners. And everyone feels that the first, it should be the very last option because it's actually very difficult to vaccinate 70% of the great apes. And in Windy alone, there's just 50% are habituated for tourism anyway. So you wouldn't have reached the other 50%. And also with vaccines, unless we're absolutely sure that it's not going to cause any harm in them, we would rather not do it because 
Okay, in the captive gorillas that you send your that you started to vaccinate the gorillas there, not the ones that were affected, but the others, the gorillas, the chimps, and other animals in the collection. And animal, they haven't really been approved COVID vaccines for animals yet, but they vaccinated them with vaccines which they know are safe and are on the way to being approved. And they, I think they even got a donation from the company. And so we're going to see how it works in captivity before we even ever think of applying it to the wild. So yeah, so generally that's how it is. Because if any, any of a, if a captive animal gets an adverse reaction, they're right there in a, in a confined space where you can actually reach to them and help them get over this situation. You don't really have that option in the wild. You know, it's very difficult, especially if it happens in the middle of the night. There's no way you just find them the next day when they're, it's too late. So vaccinating gorillas is the very last resort if all other results fail. And we feel that we all feel that it was more important to make sure that the people who come into contact with them are vaccinated. So it's the first line of defense before we actually go into vaccinating them. But as you saw with the gorillas at Windy, they also they don't you don't only need to meet them in the park, they leave the park very often. And so the people who they meet when they leave often should be vaccinated or should be in a situation where they can't give them COVID. And that's why the community health work is very, very important as well, just as much as the tourism sensitization is important, but the community health work is also particularly important during the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess a follow-up question from that is, and you've said that you're kind of working on maybe dehabituating the gorillas. Um, and I'm just so I'm curious what that looks like and how is that just going to be sort of a function of tourists backing up? Is there going to be sort of systems in place for doing that um, over a long period of time? Or um, yeah, what is that? What does dehabituation look like? <laughs> Basically, if they're getting really close, there's certain signs you do like, ah, ah, ah. And then it's normally the babies who want to come close, actually. They're very curious, just like human babies. And so they come close. The, the adults don't normally come too close. It's normally the babies. So you can just back up like, ah, ah, ah. but of course, if it's a big black buck, or like one like Canyonia that's so used to people, then the rangers move backwards and they get the tourists to move back. And then eventually the gorillas realize that the safe distance for them to be viewed is you know, further away than what they used to think. But actually we find that when you view them from a further distance, you're more likely to see natural behavior. Because when people get so close to them anyway, on top of the disease, you find that they change their behavior. Some of them, they're showing off or they stop eating or they just look. You know, a lot of things people have done research and found that their behaviors change during that one hour of the tourist visit. But if you back off and you stay further away, you get more natural behaviors. And so I think it would be good for the gorillas and other great apes in general, just keeping further away and people realize a new norm of being gorillas and chimpanzees is not getting right up close to them, but keeping further away. And actually, we've just had some training with the rangers a few weeks ago support from Darwin Initiative and University of Exeter. And, you know, it's like celebrities. When celebrities come, they, they're like, you have them saying, oh, we got so close to the gorillas. You're like, no, that's not the message a celebrity should be saying. You know, so we told, we said, in fact, we need to get these celebrities to say, it's very important that we don't get too close to these animals because we can make them sick. Then it can send a huge message because they normally have a huge following of millions of followers then everyone who's booking a permit knows I shouldn't get close to the gorillas. And this is the kind of thing that we've been doing with um, University of Exeter. We want tourists to sign a pledge before they come. And also with International Gorilla Conservation Program, they started a program of gorilla friendly pledge where people, tourists also sign up and say, I won't get close to a gorillas, I'll, I'll be a responsible tourist. So we're trying to get you know, tourists now to start signing pledges before they even arrive. And then also talk about the experience after they've left. So that encourages other people. So rather than Instagram posts showing a selfie with a gorilla, let's have a different kind of reaction, which would then encourage more responsible tourism. So that's like, it's a huge advocacy effort, but there are a number of enough people around the world who we are carrying it out with, which is, which is great. Everyone's thinking in that direction now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's incredible of how the role of social media, and, and we've talked about this in other primate conversations but how social media can really impact what people find normal and all these videos of you know chimpanzees dressed up in clothing and you know babies it's it's amazing how it just impacts people's psyches and normalizes it um 
so yeah, I think that that's, that it's wonderful that there's a push and the role of celebrities in that is also very interesting. Um, so we have time for just a couple more. Um, so I saw this, this question was asked on our YouTube, but I also saw that it was written as one of the research questions that you guys are looking into. So, um, yeah, we're just curious about what the role of behavioral and ecological research and scientific research generally about gorillas, how that can impact policy or how it can help gorilla conservation. And I know that's a, a broad question, but how do you see it as someone who studied you know, veterinary sciences and done a lot of work with gorillas from a scientific perspective, how do you see the conflation of the science and policy? Um, and what are maybe some challenges? And I'm sure there are many. And what are some of sort of some roots in, I guess, from a scientific perspective? Yes, um, definitely it's very important for the research we do to influence policy. We try very much to focus on management related research because that's, I think the most useful, especially in, in most situations anyway. And, you know, it's even as early as when I was a vet student studying parasites in the dung of the gorillas, when I found that the tourist habituated gorillas had more parasites than the non-tourist habituated gorillas. And uh, it, it came to a time in Rwanda. This was, I did this research in Uganda under Dr. Liz McPhee. Uh, who was heading the International Gorilla Conservation Program. And she was influential in Rwanda because IGCP was also working in Rwanda. And when they wanted to take tourists to the research groups, she said, ah, we're gonna quote your paper. Although she kind of felt that it lacked, you know, some information, like it may not have been the tourists who were causing the bigger parasite burden. She thought it was useful for this purpose. So yeah, no, definitely it does. And all this research that the students did under CTPH, whether tourists are willing to wear masks. There was a big debate around, I think it was 2016, where we were with a mask task force was created to try and see whether we should get people to wear masks. And everybody was like scared. They were like, what if the tourists don't come? You know, like Uganda and Rwanda were like, well, what if the tourists don't come? In both countries were kind of debating that. And that time I was sitting on the board of Uganda Wildlife Authority and I was really pushing for it. And the general management plan, it was put in there in the 10 year plan. Now it's been accomplished. And some of the board members were genuinely worried. They said tourists may just not want to do it and they, they won't come. And we need the tourists to come. But I'm like, but the risk is quite great. And so everyone was like, what if the gorillas got scared if you wear a mask and all those kind of things. But this research showed that tourists were willing to wear masks and the evidence kept growing. So by the time the pandemic arrived and when we started seeing people wearing masks in China and everywhere else, and we spoke to the wildlife authority, they were like, no, this is the time to do it because people are now used to wearing masks. So th that kind of research really helped to influence policy. And now it's become a new policy. Everyone has to wear a mask when they visit the gorillas. So yeah, no research does a lot. And as, as much as possible, we want to translate our research to policy. And um, the last question, which, uh, yeah, I think people watching this are, I'm inspired. I'm sure that lots of people, our audience are as well. And um, how can how can just students or normal people, how can they support and help CTPH? Um, what can we do? Um, is it is, yeah, do you have any sort of message for just the general audience about involvement um, with gorilla conservation? Yes, students can really help us. We host students from around the world. They come and do research with us. The, um, um, we've had students, undergraduate students, like I first went out to study gorillas and chimpanzees, but we also get masters and PhD students. And some of them, one of them published a paper on you know, YouTube videos and responsible gorilla tourism, and others published papers on human wildlife conflict. You know, so all of that really helps a lot because we, don't, we have a lot of needs and you know, we see a lot of research needs that we have, but we just don't have time to do research. So the research really helps us to address particular issues that we want to get more information on, but it also helps to strengthen our programs because we see where we need to improve according to the research that's being done. So yes, we love to host students for research. They can volunteer, um, they can help us to fundraise. Some, some students just come and help us to write grants. Um, some people help to take amazing photographs. Most of our photographs we use come from students. They have good cameras or they spent a lot of time in the field. One of them, Nick, um, came from a, a filming school in the UK and he just did 
fantastic video, some of which is being used in a video that we're using now for the, the Great Ape Education Campaign about disease in tourism. And so it just, there's so many ways that students can help us and those, and they can also give a donation through our website. Right now they can buy lots of Gorilla Conservation coffee <laughs> for Manero beans in the UK. Um, and yeah, no, there's many ways that students can help for sure. We actually try our best to like team up. We're trying to strengthen our local student program as well, get more Ugandan students engaged in research. And a lot of the time they just don't have the money and they don't know how to raise the money for their research. We try to find a way to team up international students with local students. It hasn't really worked very well yet, but when the students come, there's always local people on the ground who can help them. And if it means doing community surveys, they can help them in doing the translations. And so, yeah, there's lots of ways that student, we can work with students, definitely. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and for your wonderful talk. Um, as a brief reminder, next week, um, on Tuesday, the 25th of May, we're gonna, at 4 p.m., we're gonna have a talk by Sharina Chowdhury on the topic of physiological challenges for baboons in anthropogenic landscapes. Um, and thank you again so much, Dr. Gladys. Um, we really, really appreciate your time and it was so lovely talking to you. Thank you so much for inviting me and we hope to host you in Uganda. <laughs> Once you, you're vaccinated and you know, your universities allow you to come out, we would love to host you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much.